And today we're going to talk about, for a few minutes here, how to get the best out of the worst. Ah, we live in a fallen, a broken world. Uh, not only are there world problems, always, but national problems. That wouldn't be so bad. But there are personal problems. And they come one after the other like they're on a conveyor belt and there's no stopping. Some are our fault, others are just thrown in our laps. We didn't ask for them. But there are difficulties, adversities, and problems, problems galore. Let's start with a story. Uh, we find ourselves about 30 miles south of Jerusalem in the rugged Judean hills. Uh, there are no roads, just trails. The land is hilly, no good for farming, but uh, just fine for raising sheep and goats. And uh, this is where David is now. So we are 3,000 years ago. David is in trouble. Uh, he shouldn't be, but he is. Trouble comes our way without asking and often without our deserving it at all. But it comes. David had killed Goliath, the great Philistine enemy of the Jews. And David is now a national hero. That's all right, but there are problems. Saul is king, and Saul is jealous. The women are crying when they return from the battle. Saul has slain his thousands, but David his ten thousands. And uh, Saul's heart burns within him with envy, and he hates David. He wants him out of the way, destroyed. He makes several attempts, failures on his life, and David, just for his personal safety, decides it's best to uh, leave Jerusalem and get out of the place at the present time. And so he's down in the wilderness of Judea, quite south of Jerusalem. And amazingly, he is a leader, and he has gathered to himself a motley bunch of men. Uh, Fellows, some were in debt in their villages. They couldn't pay, and so they just left town. Uh, there are malcontents and dissemblers, uh, a, a bunch of a bunch of ragtag misfits, and he finally has gathered about six hundred of these men together, and they look to him as their leader. Amazing. And in that rough territory where there is no law or order, David has self-appointed himself and his men uh, as the police in the area to sort of watch out for the good people and uh, fend off the bad people, the sheep stealers and and rustlers, uh, people who were always up to mischief. Uh, then he's not the only one down in that territory, 30 miles south of Jerusalem. But there's another fellow by the name of Nabal, or in 1 Samuel chapter 25, Nabal. <coughs> now, Nabal is a wealthy man. He is loaded. He has 3,000 sheep. 
Obviously, he doesn't take care of them. He has a lot of shepherds working for him. And uh, throw into the mix a thousand goats also. And let's not forget Nabal's wife, Abigail. Ah, uh, she was a looker, drop dead gorgeous, and uh, not only beautiful, but a head full of common sense as well. Now, it was sheep shearing time, and this is a special uh, festive time of feasting. And uh, the sheep shears are at it, naval sheep shears, and the cooks are at it, and there's just one of those unbelievable spreads at the time. Well, uh, in these kind of feasts, you know, whether it's Christmas or Thanksgiving for us, there's always as much left over as is eaten. And so it was at that time, too. They just overdid it. And David sent a few of his men, about 10 of them, up to Nabal's men and asked for some provisions for his men. Nabal heard of it, and he was ticked off. David, who's David? And who are these people with him? They're nobodies, and what is he asking me for? And who is this son of Jesse? And he cursed him out and sent the ten men back. David is irate. He asked for leftovers, and they weren't even given to him. So he takes his armed men, 400 of them, left 200 with the baggage, and starts off, and he says, by morning, there will be no Nabal and no Nabal's household, and they'll all be gone. But there was a young fellow who heard Nabal cursing out David and went to Abigail with the story and said, now, David was always good to us. He watched out for us. And when there were uh, stealers of sheep, he would get them and protected us. And he was just a great help out in this godless, protectionless wilderness. And so Abigail decides to take the situation in hand. It's bad. David is coming with 400 men to wipe out Nabal's household, all of them. Abigail steps into the situation which is at this point a crisis. Now, notice some things about Gab Abigail. She acted, she acted promptly. It says in the text that she hastened. She hurried. Friend, when there's trouble on the scene, when there's difficulty, don't wait. It will get worse. Is your marriage uneasy? It'll be worse tomorrow and worse still next week. Do you have a son who's rebelling? Don't wait for him to improve. He's going to get worse, he and his buddies. That's right. He's going to get worse. So you need to act quickly. She hastened, it said, because this situation was rapidly deteriorating. And so she goes, but she also acted very positively. Oh, she had five sheep ready to eat and all kinds of figs and fruit and everything to go. And so she's uh, got food ready, which Nabal refused. She's got food ready to go. And so she's acting positively. She, not negatively, but positively, in a rough, deteriorating crisis situation. Now then, 
Uh, notice she also acts personally. She's going. She has her servants. The donkeys are loaded with all the food and provision that's going to David. But she goes herself. We find this in the text here. And uh, she took all this food and she's going. And she comes down and she meets David. She doesn't put this to somebody else. She doesn't pass this off to another. No, she's going to take care of it. And she acts very prudently. She, meeting David, uh, dismounts from her donkey and is on her face in the trail, her face in the dust, and she is taking the blame for this mess that they are in at this time. Uh, unbelievable. Not her fault at all. She's taking the blame. Uh, and and uh, always uh, someone is to fault. And they're always looking for someone to take the blame. It's good to pass it off to someone else. She's not at fault, but she takes the blame for it. And she says, uh, my Lord, she says, uh, that makes certainly uh, uh, of this thing that I am responsible for all of it. So there it is. What, what a, a, a situation she has. Uh, it's amazing if you find yourself in a mess of a situation, trouble, even though you didn't cause it. You can be the solution to it if you act like Abigail did. One day, many years ago, there was a lady sitting across from my desk. What did she want? She wanted the name of a lawyer. And, uh, well, lawyers are like doctors. They're specialists. And so I, I said to her, what, what's the problem? So I'd know what kind of lawyer to suggest. Well, her boy had been with some other kids in the neighborhood and in a field uh, on the north end of the community were some warehouses and to amuse themselves, they'd been throwing stones at the glass windows in the warehouse. And uh, the manager came out. Uh, the boys ran. Her boy didn't run fast enough. And the manager caught him and called the police on him. Well, well, well. So it was that... <clears throat> He had a court date, and the lady wanted a lawyer. And I said, let's forget the lawyer. I said, why don't you take your boy and your checkbook and go today, right away, over to the manager at the warehouse. Have your boy apologize, which he did, sobbing with tears, and then uh, ask the cost of the damage, write out a check. Oh, they still had the court date, of course, and she was worried about her son having a criminal record for being caught damaging property. Well, well, well. The court date came, the case was dismissed, and of course, the check she wrote to pay for the damaged glass was far less than what she would have ever paid any attorney to take the case. And what would he have said? The boy was guilty. So what would have been the defense? Uh, there was none, of course. So she saved a lot of money, but she acted like, because this Abigail thing was going through my head, she acted quickly and she acted positively. 
and she acted personally. She didn't involve anybody else. She went over with her son, and she took care of this. Now, there are all kinds of problems in this world, and life is nothing but a series of problems, every kind. There are problems at work, oh, for sure. Sometimes a problem with a neighbor. There are difficulties with uh, a family. There is no family that is free from problems, that uh, they always come up. Now, think about Abigail and get on track with her and see how well you can do. First of all, act quickly. Whatever's wrong will be worse tomorrow, guaranteed, and worse still next week. The sooner you take care of it, the better. You say uh, inflation has gotten me and I've lost my job and uh, uh, I uh, can't pay my mortgage. <laughs> well, they'll foreclose on me. I'll lose my house. No, you won't lose your house if you do an Abigail on this thing. How do you do that? Well, you go hurry. Uh, the first business day they're open, you go to the bank, yes. And, and you go personally, and you go with your checkbook and offer to pay just the interest on that mortgage. Not the full payment, which you don't have money for, but pay the interest and talk to the official at the bank and tell him, you'll do this as best you can and on time. He will not forget you. If they start foreclosing on mortgages, you will be at the bottom of the list, I promise you. He's not going to foreclose on somebody they're collecting interest from. So you've done an Abigail, and you've solved the problem, you see. It wasn't as bad as you thought, not at all. And especially in the raising of children. It is rough. There are bad influences on kids, and every child is a sinner, and even without the help of others can get in all kinds of mischief and trouble all by himself. And you worry him, I, do I have a delinquent on my hands? Well, you have a sinner by nature on your hand. And the sooner you reign in this situation, the better you are. There seem to be a lot of divorces these days. They're mounting. And among Christian people, there are as many divorces percentage-wise as in the general population. Whatever is wrong. It is simply this, my friend, that you do not act promptly. There are telltale signs of unease and disquiet in the marriage. Sir, if things have gone a little sour, in your marriage. Today, on the way home from work, stop at the florist, get that bouquet of your favorite wife, your wife's favorite flowers, and bring them home. That's a start. And then just keep going from there. Take the blame for anything that's wrong. Wife, uh, uh, you, you, you sense that uh, marriage is getting a bit dull, and your husband a bit distant and uh, disinterested in you. Well, remember, what does he like to eat? 
men like to eat. And a, a good home-cooked meal of his favorite food and his favorite dessert is a good start on this. And then, why not take the blame for the marriage deteriorating and act positively in the situation? You won the fellow to start with. Now you need to re-win him. I, I, that's all. What did you do back then? Do it again. It worked the first time. It'll work the second time. You can do it. You have the experience. Go to it. So you do not need to stand by helplessly when there's a problem, a wretched situation, a disaster, a crisis. You can always do something. But remember, time is of the essence. <laughs> and what you do must be positive, and you must be ready to take the blame for what's gone wrong. So your kid is in trouble, in trouble at school, in trouble in the neighborhood. Uh, have you neglected the youngster? Uh, do you have a, a teen daughter who's become very rebellious and sassy? Uh, you allowed this to start. You didn't clip it the first time it occurred. So you're mixed up in this. Part of this is your fault, you see. So you have to take the blame for this. You need to sit down and say, now, uh, I have not been the father that I should have been. That's a good starting point. And then you can move on to what you want done uh, with her. But there's always a way. There is no problem without a solution. It's a matter of finding it and then acting on it. There is no disaster but what you can wring some good out of it. And you need to learn how to take a bad situation, like Abigail did, and turn it into a good situation. That's what needs to be done. Uh, and no matter what it is. Uh, and uh, kids need to learn this early. If it's a terrible hot day, and uh, beastly cooking. Uh, now, <clears throat> this is a day to set up a lemonade stand and sell the lemonade that you made, see? And turn the bad day into a good day. It snows until it's almost knee deep. Ah, uh, there's money in that snow if you move it off people's walks, yes. Uh, and so it is in every situation. There's trouble at work. It may not be of your causing, but you have a solution to the problem, a way out of it. You're presenting and being to, willing to work on that solution may get the promotion that you wanted and didn't and wondered why it was not coming. There it is. But most of our problems are very close to us. They're in our families. And if we can solve the problems in our families, in our marriages, with our children, then we're on the road to solving other problems. And remember that the Lord is with you, but you have to go back 
to 1 Samuel 25 and read carefully this chapter when you have a bit of time and a time of quietness. Follow Abigail carefully. See what she did. Not only was she a gorgeous woman and exceedingly beautiful, one of these women that once you look, it's hard to stop looking. And uh, that was Abigail. But she thought nothing of taking the situation in hand that her husband had foully created. Well, so it is. That night, after she had taken care of David and his men had put their swords up and called off their attack on Nabal, Nabal is having a big party. And he is as drunk as you can get drunk. And so finally, he ends up, where most drunks do, in bed to sleep it off. Wisely, she does not tell him what she has done with David. Oh, no. Not when he's in this stupor and could even be violent. She waits till morning when he's slept it off. And then she tells him what she has done, and he knows what he did, that caused all this trouble. Oh, now, <laughs> Nabal is his name, and it means fool. And fool he is. Oh, now it is that he... <coughs> is all upset and goes into a fit of anger upon hearing what Abigail, his wife, did. And he has a heart attack that he brought on himself. And then, 10 days later, he's dead. Ah, David sees an opportunity. He marries this beautiful woman, this wealthy widow, and he gets all the 3,000 sheep and the 1,000 goats and this drop-dead gorgeous wife. So David ends up the winner by God's grace in an adverse situation, and so can you.